everyone. Welcome back to Multifamily Live. So excited for you to be here. I have a very, very good friend of mine, old friend of mine. We like, I feel like we grew up together in real estate. I want everybody to welcome Darren Smith to Multifamily Live. Welcome, Darren. Uh, thank you so much for having me on, Yari. I, I, I couldn't, I feel the exact same way. I've known, known you for years. It's been an honor to just kind of watch you grow and you and Jason through the, through the whole real estate uh, experience. Likewise. So a little bit about Darren. After serving for almost six years in the Army, Darren has spent most of the last 18 years as a professional real estate investor. He has flipped, rented, and wholesaled hundreds of residential properties and in recent years has purchased several million dollars of industrial properties as long-term holds. I cannot wait to dig into that. Darren's greatest achievement has been to surround himself with incredible, with an incredible team of industry and military veterans who are every bit as passionate about helping people as he is. His biggest supporters are his wife, Lauren, and his incredible son, Henry. Welcome, Darren. Wow. Wow. So, Darren, what I want to know is, how did you get started in real estate? I mean, I kind of touched on it in your bio, but how did you get started? And then we'll segue into uh, your industrial holdings. Would love to get into both those a bit more. I, I, we all kind of have our own unique uh, starts you know, into real estate, but a lot of them, I think, are, are similar in that you know, it was either a friend or, you know, a neighbor, somehow they just got kind of hooked on it, or maybe it was a, it was a book that they read that kind of inspired them. And for me, it was a little bit of both. Uh, I, I got out of the service back in 2003 and I had a coworker. I, you know, I worked a computer job and he owned a couple of rental properties and was doing a little bit of flips. And when I look back on it, uh, it was, you know, just a couple of houses really, but for me, it was just such an eye-opening experience. I'd never even thought of anything like that. You know, so to see someone earning money off something, like I was getting an hourly job. I knew down to the penny what I made per hour. And to, to see that there was a different way uh, of, of doing that and making money was just a real eye-opener. And then from there, I just read every book uh, basically under the sun on shift. I followed him around, kind of used him as my my mentor. Uh, maybe unwillingly he was, but uh, he, he taught, picked his brain for everything I has. And then you know books like Rich Dad Poor Dad and 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 many others from there. Um, but really, I've had to say that what really catalyzed the whole, or catalyst was the, for the whole thing was just doing it. You know, even now we take projects on and we just we just try and we do them. And it was the same thing back then. Once. You know, you can learn and read and go to seminars all you want, but until you get out there and start making offers, talking with sellers, you know, sending pieces, uh, that's really where you, you're, you begin your education. I love it. I mean, Jason, and I say the same thing over and over again, no matter how much you learn, no matter how many podcasts you're listening to. And by the way, to my listeners, thank you so very much for listening to this podcast, <laughs> but all the information that you take in use it in some way, shape or form. Every single podcast that you listen to, take a chunk of it, whatever, whatever min minuscule chunk and take action on it. That's how you get the return on your time, right? It's, we talk about return on investment all the time, but the return on your time when you're in that education piece is key. And the only way you get that return is by taking action. I loved it. I love how you jumped in with a friend. He became your mentor. What happened after that? You started flipping, you started wholesaling. Did it stop there? So I'm really glad you asked that question because everybody thinks, oh, you get into real estate and from, from there on out, you know, the money just pours in and, and, and that's, that's, it's very easy. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I, I did, I, I really just tried everything, which maybe was a bit, uh, but too much. You want to, you want to, I, if I was recommending now, I'd say be a bit more focused in your marketing efforts and, and locations and, and also your asset class, which you're going after. But I flipped some houses and I did really well. It was back in the 2000s. Everybody was making money. I mean, kind of like now a little bit. If you buy a house and you hold it for a year, you, you know, you made money. Um, it was a little bit like that back then. And I got in over my head. I absolutely did. I, I got into trailer parks and I got them into them in an area that I had to catch a plane. To, you know, I purchased, you know, I, it was over 50 uh, lots and trailers. I had a property manager there, you know, thought, man, I'm, I'm big time now. And uh, it, it turned out very poorly. I lost, you know, six figures uh, on that deal. And between that and the market shifting in 2008, um, I, I really got hurt pretty badly. I'd made enough from the other 
properties and flips and stuff that I've done that I came out okay. And I also had a really good computer job at the time. And so, uh, you know, was able to, to make it through, but no, definitely a lot of ups and downs. And I even got out of real estate for about two to three years where I went back and got my master's in computer thinking that, um, you know, I'm going to, okay, that's, that's maybe what I have to do now. I got, I got punched in the face pretty darn hard and, uh, you know, I should go back and, and stay in my, stay in my lane and, and do what I know I can do well and, and get my W2. And I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Uh, <laughs> I still had that hunger. I still had that, that kind of drive for real estate. And so I signed up when I got back in real estate about probably 2011, 12, I just signed up for buyers lists. That's what I did. And I got on all the buyers lists and one of them called me back literally like minutes later after I submitted my info said, Hey, tell me about what you're looking for. What, what, what properties you want? What, how do you buy? And I was just straight up honest with him. I said, look, I'm just getting started again. I said, I've done a bunch of stuff, but it's been a few years. I don't really know like what I'm doing. And he, again, found that mentor. And I was uh, basically his very, very, very low level assistant uh, for about a year. And so even though I was making really good money in computers, um, I made almost no money working for him, but I learned a ton. And I was just, I would go talk to sellers. I go walk properties. I do, you know, whatever was needed and learned a lot. And that got me back into it to now building up, you know, having done hundreds of flips and wholesale since then. I, I want to dig into that a little bit because I love the story because you lost, you lost six figures and that was only on that one deal. You mm-hmm. haven't even talked about what you could, like all the things that you lost during 2008, but that one deal, you lost six figures. That's huge. And I get this question a lot, especially for people that went through 2008 and they were in real estate and lost. How did you get over that fear of failure? I've gotten that question so much that I'm, Peely, I'm scared of jumping back in. Peely, I, you know, I lost a lot of other people's money. And so what do I do now? How do I, how do I step over that fear of failure? So how did, how were you able to do that? Yeah, excellent question as well. And I, I'm probably not the best person to answer from my personal perspective, just because even though I went through it, I probably have, um, I don't have a healthy enough fear, I guess. <laughs> so for me, once I got to drive to get back in, it was, I, I just, I just dove right back in. But as you, as I said, I dove back in, in a way that really, I wasn't putting much on the line besides my time where there was the much bigger fear was for my wife, obviously. I mean, you know, having to, to support her, she was going through school with residency and things at the time. And so, you know, didn't have a lot of extra money and, the mistakes I made and the position I put us in at that time, you know, that was, that was a lot to get through and building up her confidence again, that, Hey, yes, I can do this. Um, you know, yes, I can, I can make this happen. And, and, you know, this is real. You, you, you can make money and, and earn a living this way. And if I was to recommend somebody who was getting back in and, and they had that fear, maybe just fear to get started or fear to get back in because they'd lost money before. One of the main um, things that I do, and I, I recommend this for anybody is, if you're going to use other people's money, you know, if you use your own money, use money you can you can afford to lose. If you use other people's money, only and only, only, only use that money in a property. So use it in something where you have it tied to an asset that could be sold so you can return their money to them. If you're borrowing money for things like marketing, operating expenses, things like that, that's a really dangerous slope to go down. Um, and, and I would be scared if I was doing that as well. So that's what I would recommend. Put in a property that way, you know, if you're buying them right, and if you have it tied to that, even if things go wrong, <laughs> they can go really wrong. Maybe I, I won't say, you know, terribly, but for in most cases, you can at least pay your investors back um, and you've lost your time. I love it. I love that answer. So you are at the point where you got your master's in computer science, computers, um, you decided to get back into real estate. You couldn't help it. The bug got you again, but you went in back in, in such a way that you got a mentor, you went in low level, you did what it needed, what you needed to do to get back in, to learn again, and to get back into the game as it was, because things changed year after year. So take us further into your story. Now what? You're, you're an assistant, you're starting to get back in. So what happens next? I probably would have stayed on working with him more. He was a great guy in our, in our local community here. Uh, my wife wanted to do a fellowship. And so that brought us out. We moved from Pennsylvania out to Colorado. So of course I could no longer be his apprentice anymore. And when I got out there, I, we actually moved out there. I didn't have a job lined up, but I wasn't too worried about it with, with my, my resume. So I did, I got a job fairly quickly and was doing the nine to five thing. 
but also doing real estate. And I was, you know, nights, weekends, I was handwriting, you know, abandoned signs. I was, you know, printing off letters and mailing them and putting stamps on. I, I just I kept the bug that I had from learning from him and I took it out there and I did every, you know, every step and I did it the hard way and I did it the, you know, the, the inexpensive way. And I put in a lot of my time and not a lot of my, um, not, not as much of my money and then slowly build it from there. I started out flipping. I did a couple of flips out there in Colorado and quickly realized finding houses was the challenging part. And so that was what I decided to focus on. And I went full on into wholesaling at that point. So that was really where I spent most of my time was marketing, talking with sellers. Um, and about maybe about a year and a half after that, what, what really catalyst catalyzed it was the catalyst from there was getting into seven figure altitude is what it's called now. It was house flipping HQ, um, you know, Justin and now Bill Allen's running it. And I'm still in that group and still learn an, an immense uh, amount of information. But not only that, just the, the people you connect with. It's not just the data. You know, as we said, it's the relationships you make. Um, and I've learned and grown so much through that. So that from there allowed me to start hiring people, scaling things up, outsourcing marketing, outsourcing different things. Uh, to now to the point, uh, three years ago, I moved back to Pennsylvania with, with my wife and now our son. Uh, and I was able to keep that business going. So all of my employees right now are in Colorado. I'm living in Pennsylvania. We wholesale and flip in Colorado and in Pennsylvania where I live, um, but I have no, no employees here. And honestly, I don't really have to do anything here on the ground. Um, and I owe everything to the, what I learned from seven figure flipping and, you know, and other, think, other sources, but mostly, mostly my team. I mean, I just have an incredible um, you know, group of people that, you know, in every way they are better at what they do than what I, you know, what I used to do in that position and how I got to that. Cause I know that's, that's, that's gonna be a question. How do you find good people? If I just had the right, you know, if I had this A plus person, if I had this, this killer team member would do it. You read my mind. <laughs> yeah. And my answer to them was uh, you're, you're thinking about it the wrong way. Uh, think about it as how do I become the kind of person that an A team wants to work for? I had many people that came to me before, and I'm not saying they're, they're near as good as the people that I have now, because I got, I got the best people in the world right now. And there, there's, there's no doubt about that, but I was not the person, I was not the, the leader, the, the CEO, the whatever you want to call it, that was able to, to recruit and give those people what they needed in their lives. I wasn't as invested in them as I needed to be. I couldn't provide them that leadership. And so I've grown a lot from them. I have a, I have a business coach that has nothing to do with real estate. And um, over the last four years, he's taught me a considerable amount about how I can give them what they need and support them. And they've just become incredible people in every way. They were incredible people in every way. And I was able to take that and grow it even further and teach them the real estate side because none of them had done real estate before, um, but they were just good people all around. And, and uh, now I couldn't do it without them. So very, very happy with the team. I love it. I love that you dove into the team and you mentioned that a lot of your team members are just industry professionals now and military veterans. Can you dive a little bit into that? Yeah, that, that's correct. So one of them was a real estate agent uh, previously. And so she had done a little bit, but I, I don't know if she'd actually sold a, sold a house. So it was kind of like had dipped her toe into it, you know, tried it a little bit before, um, but her, her role is transaction coordinator. And what I love about that role is it's half administrative. So you have to be really high level organized and all that, but it's also, I would say half counselor. <laughs> and so you, you have to be able to talk people through the emotions, the ups and downs of the closing process. It can be, it can be kind of traumatic uh, in a lot of things, you know, what, where, where'd that $20,000 lien on my house come from? I don't know about that, you know, and, and people will start crying on the phone. So there's that. Um, another member of my team was in, in the, uh, in the service before. Um, so he, we have a veteran and then I was, of course, you know, in the service for six years. Um, but they're really just, they were professionals. They were at a high level in their previous careers before they came to me and before they came to, to this team. And so when I'm looking for somebody out there, I don't really care if they have real estate experience um, so much because I think you can learn a lot of the technical aspects of it, but what have they done where they were, you know, the best or were really passionate about something? And it doesn't have to be even a job. It could be, maybe they were you know, valedictorian of their school, maybe they were, you know, a high level athlete or their you know, concert pianist, or, you know, whatever that thing is that they just really love doing and they have passion about. And if you can take that and find out how you can make sure you're supporting their other passions and the thing that they, they want to develop in life, they'll also be passionate about your business and they'll, they'll, they'll take that same level of ambition and, and drive and 
you know, be successful in, in your company as well. I love that note. I'm Jason. And I do the same thing. We look for the passion. We look for we look for success in other fields. And real estate's kind of like a on the side. Like if they know a little bit about it, great. But I'd rather teach them everything I know so they do it my way <laughs> than than having to like remold them. So I love that. So let's go back to your real estate journey. You you went through seven figure flipping, and I this is I mentioned this in the beginning. Everyone, we kind of grew up together. I actually left seven figure flipping when I went into large multifamily because flipping and you know multifamily. So you continue through that. And you also said you have a business coach. How has mentorship and coaching helped you further your goals? Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without seven figure to get me to, from, from the business or from the real estate side, marketing, the, just, just the ideas. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever had an original thought about this. I just take the little pieces from all the different people in a group. And there's dozens and dozens that are, I mean, they're doing seven figures. I know there's people and they're doing, you know, eight figures and, and, and higher uh, in, in their investments. And so I take those little pieces from them and, and apply them. I would say the most important thing though, is I almost learn more about growing myself more than my business from my business coach and from learning from other people in the group, how they have bettered themselves. So what books are they reading about, you know, self-development? You know, one of my favorites is Darren Hardy's compound effect. And so what are people doing to, you know, they're doing, they're doing yoga. They're doing, Hey, this is, um, this is, how, this is a leadership program, you know, that I'm doing. This is a Tony Robbins thing that I'm doing. And then along with my business coach, who teaches me how to be that better leader and a better person and, and just focusing my life. That's really the most important thing. You can learn about the latest postcard or the latest, you know, Facebook marketing ad campaign. And those are things you can almost hire out. You can't hire out you know, who you are. Um, and that's, that's been the, biggest thing that I've taken from all these groups and just honestly makes you you know, a happier, well-rounded person. I love it. You can't hire out who you are. Like in these mastermind groups, these, these coaching programs only exemplify, uh, push out that leader that you're meant to be. So fantastic answer. Now let's Ooh, let's dig into industrial properties. So you go from flipping, wholesaling, rentals to millions of dollars of industrial properties as long-term holds. Let's dig into that. How did you start getting into that? And how is that business going? Like everything else I've done, uh, it was, I learned from somebody else. I, I didn't really know much about industrial or commercial at all, but I have two, two really good friends out in Colorado and that's what they were doing. One was really focused on the multifamily and uh, small office and now fairly large office, you know, kind of is his niche, but just learned what he was doing and how he was you know, growing those, those, that portfolio. And then there's another friend who he was in kind of every asset class. He started multifamily, has done office, industrial, retail, Starbucks, you, know, you name it. And so just, just picking their brains and it was almost a, a light bulb, like that first, when I sat next to that coworker, oh, you can rent a house out, you can flip a house. It was the same thing. Here's this whole other world out there. And there's a lot of similarities to uh, the single family, you know, one to four unit world, but uh, there's a lot of differences as well in that it's, it's almost a different language. And so learning that, you know, people are like, how do I get started? How do I, how do I even learn? Like, how do I learn what, what's a warehouse worth? Well, again, I, I have no idea. I don't know what, what a lot of these properties are worth when I'm a person that's home with people. So what do I do? I, I call brokers. I call people that do know. I reach out to the people who are going to have the information I need. And just, again, it's all networking. It's all talking with other people. And then eventually you learn the thing. Eventually, you know, you've analyzed enough properties. You've talked to enough sellers. You're like, oh yeah, I was in the one down the street, you know, six months ago talking to the other seller. And so you remember those, those little tidbits, but that's it. That's how I kind of got industrial was just you know, seeing that it's out there and then just kind of dove right in. And I guess I'll take it one step further was I didn't start with industrial. I didn't, I didn't know. Cause I'm like, I want to do commercial. That's, that's like saying, I want to do real estate. I mean, there, there, there's about a million ways you can do that. And so I kind of dipped my toe into a, a couple of different asset classes. I was marketing to retail. I was marketing to office. I was doing that. Um, industrial is the one for me that I liked it because it was a little bit, it seemed like a little bit simpler. You know, a lot of it's, you know, shells, warehouses, things like that. Don't go wrong. You can get super complicated. I have a, a closing on Wednesday and 
<laughs> environmentals can drive you uh, drive you insane. Definitely some complications, but I liked it. It was you know one, two, three tenants in these buildings, uh, you know, versus you know a lot a lot more of them. And I liked the uh, the people that I was talking to on them. It's a, it's a lot of you know former business owners who you know maybe they ran their own company out of it, or maybe you know, kind of they own the building and they've had it for 20, 30 years, and now they're just kind of looking to scale back. So I just I seem to really be able to hit it off with the sellers in that market as well. So I like to focus. And so once I, I had this broad thing, I kind of dipped my toe in a little bit of each. I found what I like, and that's what I would recommend other people. Find what you like and then narrow in on that. Narrow in on the asset class, narrow in maybe on the geography, narrow in on how you market to those asset classes. And then once you've mastered that and you're like, man, I got those things down, take one of those and expand it out. Take you know maybe another asset, class, maybe another a little bit of ge geography. Maybe I'm doing, instead of just postcards, now I'm also calling and now I'm doing, doing web, but one thing at a time and then, then move on. I love that. Would you mind? Because I don't do industrial. I have never looked at it. I, I like you, I focus. And when my, I'm like, I'm like a horse with blinders on, I just called myself a horse. I'm like a horse with blinders. on. I put the blinders on and I mega focus on something. That's something that seven figure flipping taught me how to do, because that's where my, that's how I get things done. If I focus on stuff. So I hear industrial, I'm like, no, Unless, unless I have a very, very good reason to go there, I'm not going to go there. But for my listeners who are thinking about jumping into a different asset class, maybe they're a flipper and wholesaler, maybe they haven't done any real estate and they're like, industrial sounds really, really interesting to me. Could you walk through a deal with me? Like, how do you get the deal? How do you source it? How do you, how do you, like, how do you, how, how does it work? Great question. Uh, <laughs> It's a lot, as I said earlier, it's a lot of the similarities to the residential side. So if you've already, if you've bought a house, if you've marketed and bought a house and talked to a seller and closed, you already have a lot of the steps that you need. So I just took those and tweaked them over to the industrial side. So my best marketing channel right now is auto pen uh, handwritten letters, the ones where they have the machine with the pen and I get, it's very personal. There's a stamp on it and I send those out short and sweet. I think it's 300 characters or less. So I'm not saying a whole lot. Uh, you know, basically just, Hey, saw your property at, you know, this address, you know, I'm a local industrial investor. I'm the owner and operator. You can talk to me and you know, something to that effect. Very simple. So I get phone calls with that. I get emails back from that. And then just like you're doing with sellers, I have, I, I have CRMs costing thousands of dollars. I still use a Google sheet for my, <laughs> for my industrial stuff, just because it's so simple and, uh, <laughs> and easy for me. Okay. My team uses the other stuff. I use a Google sheet. So, uh, you know, don't think you got to get all fancy and crazy to do this stuff. Simple letters. Um, and then, uh, then I put them in my, in my CRM that I have and then just have that conversation. So you're, it's all about listening. Um, I, we, we follow the John Martinez sales training uh, method. We've used them for years. It's, it's the Sandler training. If anybody's familiar with that, it's, it's almost identical, just applied to real estate. And it works fantastic. It's because it's all about listening to that person, solving their problem. Like you're not, when you're talking on the phone, you're not there like, how can I make this deal work? If you're thinking about numbers and, and, you know, money and, you know, like all that kind of stuff, when you're walking in, you're already, you, the, the, the sellers can feel that. So do the same thing. And I'm probably getting too much on the sales side of this, but I really just want to emphasize how important that step is. So talk to them, listen to them, solve their problem, you know, be a person, build that rapport, you know, and truly oh, care. about. It. And you can dive as deep as you want into this, because this is super important. Because if you don't make that connection, because I believe that the relationship comes first. Everything else is secondary. If you can make that relationship with the seller, then they will sell to you. If you don't make that relationship, then it's doubly hard for them to get to that position. So keep on going. It, it, it is. I'm, I'm glad that you feel the same way and have had the same uh, experiences out there. It's, it is, I'll, I'll just relay a quick um, story on, on my sales manager, Jeremy. We closed a property about two weeks ago and the week after that, the seller called him up and, and said, you know, uh, I have some stuff in my house that I really want. She's, she's very elderly, she can barely get around. And the house was a extreme hoarder house. We actually had movers come to the house, to try and move some stuff out. They refused to even go inside. They said, nope, this is not something we're going to deal with. So what does Jeremy do? This is after closing. We've already you know, got our check. You know, she's actually moved. He, he put on an M95 mask and for four hours went in there and pulled out the stuff that she wanted, took it, took it to a storage shed and put it inside. 
And I'm telling you that for two reasons. One, because Jeremy is, a, is an amazing guy and that's the type of person he is, but that's the type of mentality you have to have in this business that you have to really want to help the person. And that, you know, him doing that after the fact, he didn't do that. But you know what that does? Sellers know if you're that kind of person, they'll know. Like, like it's, it's not like you can hide that kind of stuff. And so the fact that he was willing to do those kind of things, it comes across in his conversations and people know, like, and trust him ahead of time. And he proves it over and over again. So do the same thing with your, if you're looking to get into industrial, just be the type of person willing to go, you know, above and beyond, you know, do those extra things that, uh, you know, that surprise people. I, I'm closing on a property. Uh, actually, I have two of my biggest closings ever next Wednesday. And one of them, we found out um, there was about 80,000 pounds worth of grass turf, uh, artificial grass turf in the warehouse that we thought was going to be gone. That wasn't. And my buyer was like freaking out on this one. He's like, holy crap. I mean, this is going to cost a, a fortune to get rid of. I got on Facebook. I advertised it, free turf. We, I, we rented a forklift. I got some property managers that worked for me to come out. And we emptied out 80,000 pounds of turf you know, in a day. And then I got the sweepers in and, and some blue scrapers and we got it all done. But those are kind of the, the things, you know, if you do that and after the fact, they're like, holy cow, you did, you did what? Like, you know, that, that's, that's a wow factor. And this is actually a, uh, my buyer on this is someone who he owns hundreds and hundreds of thousands of square feet of industrial in the area. And uh, we'll be working together again is, is the bottom line. I didn't do that because of that. I mean, you just do that because that's part of what you do and, and part of how you get the deals done. But, um, you know, leave that impression, be the type of person that goes above and beyond and, and it helps. Um, Okay, I'll stop with sales right now because I don't. I know you said I could go on, but I could. We, we could talk about that for literally hours. No, now. but that's that's the type of stories that people should hear because that that are that's the things that people will remember. Yes, they'll remember that you brought them a good deal. Yes, they'll remember that you took care of them. But doing those small things like emptying out that house, you didn't have to do that. You could have kept on going and pounding the pavement trying to find somebody else, or you could have just been like, you know what, it's done, it's sold. I like I did it. Like I'm going to walk away now. Instead, uh, Jeremy went in and <laughs> took care of it. And then the, all that grass, you could have been like, well, that's not our problem now. It's, that, that's your problem. A lot, some people might say that, but instead of saying that you did the right thing, you took care of it, might have made some money on the side selling the turf, who knows, but because uh, you're shaking your head, right. Darren's shaking his head right now. But the thing is, you took care of it. You take care of your of your partners. These people become your partners. So Darren, before I let you go, because we've gone above the hour, you are amazing. Thank you so very much to co for coming on my show. How can people reach you if they want more information on industrial? If they want, if they have an industrial building they want to sell to you, how can they get a hold of you? I would love to hear from any of your audience, whether they have a property to sell or whether they just want to, you know, connect and learn some more. Uh, my website for the commercial side is solidgrowthproperties.com. So it's Darren, D-A-R-R-E-N at solidgrowthproperties.com. Thank you so very much. I'm super grateful to you for coming on my show. I'm grateful you have me on, Yari, and I look forward to actually just chatting with you again soon here. Yes. And for everyone else that is listening, I am grateful to you as well. If you love what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe. That would mean the world to me. So much aloha, so much love, so much peace. Bye now.